reading from the first verse to the third verse, giving from the subject of new beginnings. God, let me say it real clear, God loves new beginnings. God is a fan of new beginnings. God knows all about new beginnings. The Bible says that when the earth was formed without void, uh, waters covered the face of the earth, and then, and then he said, let there be. And there it was. He created uh, something from nothing. God loves new beginnings. And I want to get into this message this morning. I know it is the end of February, or, or middle of February, and you say, preacher, this is a New Year's message, but really, uh, anytime you're with the Lord, uh, anytime you're in Christ, if you, you made up your mind to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you can have renewals and new beginnings all the time. Amen. Amen. You can have them all the time. It's not like being in a relationship with people. Sometimes you can't get a renewed fellowship from a brother or sister or an ex or, or whatever. Sometimes it's it. Sometimes they won't let you come back to the job. They call that termination. Amen. Amen. I'm like, I'm going to bless somebody today. Even if you lose your job, you don't have to worry. God loves new beginnings. Looking in that particular text, in those first three verses, I, I saw a wonderful church service going on. In the middle of verse 1 through verse 3, uh, they, came, they came with a purpose. They were fasting and had sackcloth. They were serious about uh, what they were doing. There comes times in our lives where we get serious about the things of God. Right. Yeah, there's a moment in time in life where we push pause and we, we get serious. That's why I ask you to raise your hands and lift your hands to the Lord and, and worship Him because God does reign. God does reign. He does reign. And it's wonderful for us to acknowledge all the good things that He does in our lives and because He is wonderful. They were there with fasting. They even separated themselves from the other people that were around them. They said, hey, you know, we've been fellowshipping with all the different nations, but God is so good to us, and he is giving us a new beginning, because you, if you've been with us in Nehemiah 9, you know they have a new beginning yeah. where they are. And they said, let's separate ourselves from the rest of the world, and let's, let's get along with God, us, these people, and let's commune with God. And they got together, and then they stood, and they were confessing their faults and their sins and their their, their, the things they've done wrong, even from their mom and daddy in them. They were saying, Lord, you know, forgive my people. Forgive my daddy. Forgive my mama for what he, she did or didn't do, etc., etc. What is happening here is God is moving on their hearts. And this is a church service. They get through confessing and they pick up the Bible and they start reading. And they start reading. Now listen, they didn't read for 20 minutes. They didn't read for 30 minutes. They didn't read five chapters. They didn't read whatever they read. It took a quarter of the day. That's a long time. A quarter of a day? Six hours. You're right, 12 hours a day. They were reading it one quarter of the day and then put it down. Then they picked it up and they read it another quarter of the day. Why is that? Because they wanted to know about this great God who has done so much for them, who brought them in, out of, they were in bondage, and God brought them out of that captivity, of 70 years of captivity, brought them out and put them in their own place, and the temple was rebuilt, and the wall was rebuilt, and now they're just, they're just having a joyous time because God has brought them back together again. In other words, they've had a new beginning in their life, and they're just showing God how grateful they are, so much so the Bible says that they begin to worship Him. Did you know that's what leads to worship is confession of your sins? What leads to true, honest, heartfelt, deep, compassionate worship is acknowledging our sins and our faults before the Lord so that God himself can cleanse us from those things. God does that because he loves us. And I want to give you three reasons why I believe you and I can have a new beginning from the word of God in chapter 9. The entire chapter 9, I will not read all of it to you. Let, it, let the church say, I will, I will read, read Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter, nine. chapter 9. The Lord heard you now. Don't be praying now. The Lord heard you already. You have made a promise that you will go home and read Nehemiah chapter 9. Now let me give you three reasons why I believe God wants to give us new beginnings and why you should be excited about receiving a new beginning no matter where you are in your life. Here's the first point I want you to write down. It's because of God's great hand. 
It's because of God's great hand. Please don't close your Bibles. Keep them open. They're in, one, in verses 1 through 6 dealing with God's great hand. That God can handle anything in your life. Oh, yes. God can handle anything in your life, no matter how big, how small, how nasty, how clean. It does not matter. God can handle any and everything that goes down in your life. It's in verse 6 that we learn, first of all, that from God's great hand, that God handles all of creation. Verse 6 says, uh, you alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all this starry host. The earth and all that's on it, the seas and all that's in them, you give life to everything. Yes. Yes. Hey, this is good theology, my brothers and sisters, because it helps us to know, even though in school they taught us about evolution and that we were we were brought up by uh, uh, bacteria and, yes. and and then there was a big explosion, you know, and then everything happened. No, no, no. God made the heavens and yes. God made the earth. God made human being and mankind. God is the creator of all, and God can handle all creation. God knows how many, God knows if there's really aliens out there. Oh, yes. Amen. God knows, God, God knows all the galaxies and the stars, and he is watching after each and every one of them because he is God, Jehovah. There was none before him, and there will be none after him. He has no beginning, and he has no end. God can handle all of creation because of his great hand. Secondly, not only can he handle all of creation, but he can handle all for eternity. Yes. Look right there in verse 5 it says, one verse above that, stand up and praise the Lord your God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. God will be there even when you're not there. Yes. God will be there even when the oldest relic in history will no longer be there. God has no end and he watches all for eternity. You said, preacher, that's a long time. It's not. A, it, time doesn't even matter to God because he will always be who he is and he will always be there. He, God can handle all of creation. God can handle all for eternity. But this, God can handle all by his name. Look in verse 5 and 6. It's two parts there. In verse 5 it says, Blessed be your glorious name and may it be exalted above all blessings and praise. You know what we say, hallelujah is the highest what? Praise. Well, did you know his name is above that highest praise? God's name is so great that he is exalted above anything and everything. You can trust his name. You can depend on his name. God's name is higher than sin and disobedience and blasphemy and rebellion. God's name is higher than hurt and pain and rejection. His name is higher than, than the pain of fatherlessness and abandonment and disappointments. God's name is higher than sickness and disease and dis-ease. God's name is great, my brothers and sisters, and it is high above it. The Bible says in Luke that God's name is so great that it's holy. John said his name is so great that we were able to become children of the Most High God. Acts said his name is so great that nobody can be saved except through the name of Jesus. And in Philippians, he said his name is so great that, at the knee, that, that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess the ones that are in heaven, people that are on earth, and those that are under the earth, that the Lord reigns. He's good. His name is above all, brothers and sisters, because God can handle all by his name. You and I should be excited, I pray, about that because no matter where you find yourself in life, God can handle it all, guys. God can handle all of your mistakes. He can handle all of your faults. He knows where to put them. He knows, he knows who's really guilty. He knows who's really done wrong. God can handle it all. Thank God nothing escapes his eye because when it is put in his hands, you can trust that the Lord is going to work it out. Will the Lord work it out? Yeah. Hey, man, I know it's cold outside. You want to turn the heat back up? Y'all get excited for me. Get excited. Say amen. 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 Jesus, Mary and Joseph. All right, so here's what we want to do today. We want to put our faith in Christ Jesus alone. We want to put our faith in the Lord right by himself. You know, sometimes we have faith in our faith. We push our faith. If I just have faith, to do this. If I have faith, this amount of faith, or that amount of faith, and, and, and i got to get more faith. And I said, get more faith for what? 
It's not about how much faith you have. It's who do you have your faith in. When you have your faith in your faith, that it's limited because there are times if we would honestly be true, and sometimes we uh, we doubt. Yeah, we look at our circumstance, we look at our checkbook, we look at the things that are happening in our life, and I don't care, you could just testify last Sunday how much mountain moving, yoke destroying faith you have. But sometimes when you see the obstacles in your life, you know what happens to us? We begin to we begin to doubt. We begin to, uh, you know, all that great testimony we had, we're like, man, I wish I'd never said it in church. Had I never said it, the devil wouldn't hurt it, and he wouldn't have caused this trouble in my life. No, no, the issue of the matter is, it's not about how much faith you have, it's about who you have your faith in. If you have your faith in your job, my brothers and sisters, if your job loses, you might lose your mind. Or if you lose your job, you might lose your mind. If you have your faith in all the things that your hands can do and your hands can touch, if something were to happen to your hands, what happens to your faith? It's about putting your faith in God. That guess what? That even if I myself fall short in my faith, because my faith is in God, the Lord's got my back. He's the one that makes all the difference. And thank God it takes the pressure off of me of trying to perform and trying to keep up. How do you know when you've reached the highest level of faith? How do you know, how do you know when, when you've gotten just enough faith? At what point do you know when, okay, I've run out of faith? Sometimes life is so complicated and troubles have come so hard that you don't have time to pull out the list of uh, not faith this week, no faith that week. I prayed, I put on the whole armor, I gave this amount of money, I went to that service, I did the All the list of things that we say we need to do to have faith. What happens when life is ramming you so hard you ain't got time to check your list? Here's what you do. You say, God, you are great. You are in control. Your hands are big enough to handle all of my mess, all of my shortcomings, all of my issues. And when I can't sometimes get it right in my head because life is slapping me around, God, I trust you that you've got me in the palm of your hands and you'll take care of me. That's where, that's where you leave it and you can rest and you can rejoice in the Lord that the Lord is with you and is on your side. What should you do when you, when you come to this grip? It's in verse 6. We should do what the angels do and just worship the Lord because he's got you in the palm of his hand. That his hand can handle everything you're going through. Secondly, not only do I want you to see God's great hand when it comes to new beginnings, but secondly, I want you to see that God's, see God's guided help. It's in verses 7 through verse 30. I'm not going to read that today because time won't permit. But verses 7 through 30, I want to show you God's guided help. God guides and helps his people. The commentators say that in verses 7 through verse 30, the word give is used 16 times. And it's used in different ways. It's used in that different ways in 16 times because no matter what happened in Israel's life, God always did right by Israel, even when Israel did not do right by God. Amen. God helps his people. God helps his people. Say that with me. God helps his people. Are you his people? It, it, it matters because if you are his people, God is coming to help you. It's here in the text we choose. I want to show you three things that he helps us with. Number one, with them, God chose them. God chose them. Verses 7 through 18, God chose them. He chose them to be his people. He chose them that they may stand, stay in the land that he gave them. And he chose them to bear his name. God chose them to be his people. Why? I have no idea. It was his own decision, his own purpose. I have no idea. The, the Bible doesn't even make it clear why God chose them. He just chose them. God not only chose them, but again God says, I'm going to bless you with this land. He told Abraham, I want you to get out from your, your kin people, and I'm going to make a great nation out of you. I'm going to send you to a land that flows with milk and honey, and from that land, you and your people will be like the sands of the sea. You couldn't even name them. I mean, that's like the biggest family reunion you'd ever think of. He says, that I'm going to have your descendants numerable, innumerable, that you can't even name them. God shows them, I don't know why, but God gave them this beautiful land. And I don't know why, but also God says, I'm choosing them to bear his name. They're going to bear my name. Why did he choose them? I don't know why. 
But God chose them. And can I say, I don't know why God chose you to be born in the family you were in, but you were born there. He chose you for that. I don't know why God allowed certain things to happen in your life, but God allowed it. But one thing you can be rest assured is that God has chosen you. His hand is upon you, and he's chosen you for such a time as this. And not only did he chose you, he's going to guide you, give you God in help. Secondly, not only did he choose them, but he cared for them. Verses 19 through 22, when they were walking through the wilderness, and even in their point of disobedience, when they pulled out a golden calf, mm -hmm. Pastor Aaron builds this golden calf, yeah. and they say, this calf is beautiful, we will worship the calf. And they worshiped the calf and said, this calf brought us out of bondage. And it, can I say it made God real mad? Uh -huh. Who he had brought them out and then they turned around and said uh, that this golden calf brought us out. And you say, how, well, I'm not going to use that word, but how off can you be uh, and still breathe the same air? So God still cared for them that when they were in the desert, God did not abandon them. Amen. That's why I want you to know, even in your life, when you sin or fall short or miss the mark, God does not abandon you. I'm talking about true, legitimate children. Children that said, you know what, God, I give you my heart today, and I will follow you all the days of my life. Sometimes we stop following, but guess what? He said, I will be with you. I won't leave you, and I won't forsake you. I'm talking about true children of God. He didn't abandon them while they were in the desert. Also, he assisted them when they were in the desert. Yeah. The Bible says that while they were in there, he led them in the, at night with a pillar of fire, uh -huh. and he led them during the day with a pillar with a cloud. And what he did, he covered them and watched over them. And then the text says that his spirit was there to instruct them and to lead them. As a Christian, don't you know? You should know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and when Christ comes and saves your soul. The the power of the Spirit of the Holy Ghost comes and lives inside of you. And you are never, ever alone. And no matter what you're going through, He stays right there to help guide you and to give you the help that you need in your life. Can you say amen? amen. Not only did He care for them by not abandoning them, or and He cared for them by assisting them, but He also accommodated them. Now, you don't like this. Now, He didn't have to, they didn't have to go get a job. They didn't have to go down to the food stamp line. They didn't have to apply for WIC. They didn't have to uh, get the EBT card. They didn't have to do any of that. While they were walking through the desert trying to get to their destination of 40 years, not 40 days, 40 years, while they were walking through the desert, God provided clothing for them and shoes for them. And each year as they grew, you look like this, their clothes grew. Each year as their feet grew, their shoes grew. That's crazy. No, that's God. That's what that is. They, what, what he's trying to show us is that God provides for each and every one of us. And so as they grew, everything grew. Well, you say, how did they eat? God allowed the ravens to come down enough and to bring food to them. And they were able to kill these uh, birds and things so that they could have food. And they had it every single day. They didn't miss a meal, they didn't miss a day, they didn't miss a week. It was every single day the Lord our God provided for these children. What are you saying, preacher? That God guides us and he helps us every day of your life. You said, I need a job. God knows about it and he is ready to provide for you a job. Why? Because the Bible says a man that don't work. Yeah, y'all need to remember that one. A man that does not work. Does not eat. If you sketch it into your children's underwear, when they get old, they will never forget it. You must, in order to eat, you've got to work. What he's trying to teach us is that God will provide yes. for you. Yes. That God will help you. Even in your deepest yes. trouble, the Lord will help you. He doesn't leave you. He, 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 what he did, he cared for them. He chose them, he cared for them, but finally he also corrected them. His God had helped now. He guides people. He guides people. Religion today says, some, the, some theology today is that God just wants to bless you. And he just wants to give you stuff. But that's not biblical theology about God. God not only does want to bless you, and he wants to show he cares for you because he's chosen you, but he also will correct you. God corrects his children. God 
guides us in the way that he wants us to go because God knows if we obey him, life will be good. Will you have tests and trials? Yes. Will you have some persecutions and troubles? Yes. But if you obey the Lord, the Lord will always make sure things work out for your good. I don't know in every situation how he does it, but God knows he makes it work out. When it's all over, you say, God, man, you were good in that situation. Mm -hmm. You were watching out for me. I couldn't see how it was formulating in the smoke. It was after the dust settled that I saw how good you were to me in that midst of that situation. God corrected them. He used evil nations. He allowed evil nations to come in and to spank up all the children of Israel because the Israelites had this particular issue that I believe we have today. God is good, and he's good all the time. And when God's been good to us, sometimes we forget about God. Then when the Lord says, okay, all right, I'm going to take some of my goodness off, I'm going to take some of my blessings off, and we start feeling the pain and the pressure of correction, we start crying back out to the Lord of how good he is. And then God, I hate to say he's a sucker for a good praise. I don't want to say that, but God loves his people so much, we're crying out to him, God would bless them again. And they would start enjoying the things of God and start being happy again. But then, this thing that happens to all of us, we find ourselves, because we're doing good, we feel like we don't have to pray. We, there's no need to talk to God. I'll talk to God when I need something. And God is saying, no, I want you to talk to me regardless of what you need. I want a relationship with you, not just so you, I, can, I can meet your need, but I want a relationship with you so you and I can commune and talk together. I can be your friend, you can be mine. And so this pattern happened year after year after year after year after year. And you know what God did? God finally took the land from them by putting them into captivity for 70 years. God finally says, hey, you guys are not getting the point. You're not getting it that I love you so much and the way you're going and worshiping other gods and following other religions and denying me. He says, I, this is not right. You're going to end up hurting yourselves. You're going to cause trouble in your own nation. He allowed their nation to be taken captive because God was trying to correct them. <coughs> And children, can I say to you, children, if you listen to me real closely, that here's how you know your parents love you, is that they don't let you get away with stuff. Right. You and I, all of us who are growing up and who are grown now, understand when we look back at tr our true parent and their love, a true parent with true love, when they chastise us, they, 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 they prerequisite with this statement, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. I hadn't figured it out yet either. The, 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 uh, the nerve endings in my backside still do yeah, not. Yeah. It doesn't make sense what you're saying. What he was there trying to say is, it hurts me to have to discipline you, but it's very necessary. Proverbs says, a child left to their own will bring shame to their parents. Why? Because the scripture says that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. We do some crazy things sometimes. We say some off-the-wall stuff. Our young people get into some crazy things. You can tell them left, right, and center not to do something, but there comes a time when you have to connect the dots. You understand? If you touch, the, don't touch the stove. Don't touch the stove. What happens if you touch the stove? You're going to get burned. Well, every now and then, some child does not believe that heat and your fingertips don't go together. Stove and fingertips don't match. And one child will absolutely just try it out. It's glowing, it's red, it's pretty, and you know what happened. Why? What's try, they're try, our parents are trying to help us understand as they discipline us and correct us is that if I don't correct you, you're going to head down the wrong path. My grandfather used to say, if you don't hear somebody now, one day you're going to hear somebody behind bars. If you don't get yourself in check now, one day you're going to roll up on the wrong person and you will no longer be alive. You must learn some disobedience and you must learn, let God, let your parents correct you. Parents, it's the same thing with us. Now listen, here's how you and I know that we're children of God is that God don't let us get away with stuff. God does not allow us to get away with stuff. Let me read you this text in Hebrews chapter 12, 5 through 11. He says, my child, don't think the Lord's discipline is worth nothing. And don't stop trying when he corrects you. The Lord disciplines everyone he loves. He punishes everyone he accepts as a child. Verse 7 says, so accept suffering like a father's discipline. 
God does these things to you like a father. Uh, does things like a father correcting his children. You know that all children are disciplined by their fathers. We're talking about good fathers. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you never receive the discipline that every child must have, you are not true children and don't really belong to God. That's heavy. We have all had fathers here on earth who corrected us with discipline, and we respected them. So it is even more important that we accept discipline from our father of our spirits. If we do this, we will have life. Verse 10 says, our fathers on earth disciplined us for a short time and the way they thought was best. But God disciplines us to help us so that we can be holy like him. Yes. Final verse 11, he says, we don't enjoy discipline when, it, when we get it. It is painful, but later, after we have learned our lesson from it, we will enjoy the peace that comes from doing what is right. Anybody glad that your mom or your daddy or somebody in your life yes. pulled your coattail yes. and told you to straighten up and fly yes. right? Amen. That if they hadn't talked to you, you would have done some things that have gotten you into a whole lot of trouble. Yes. God does that for us because he loves us so much. That's a part of our new beginnings, church. Sometimes God's got to discipline you to get you to your new beginning. God's got to, listen, God doesn't just spank your butt and tell you and, and, and fuss at you. But what he does, he, he goes and he punishes you. But then he shows you what you did wrong. And finally, he'll show you this is how you do it right. That's good parenting. It's not just enough to fuss at your children, but it's enough to show them, listen, you did this wrong, but I want to show you how to do this right. And it will yield a fruit in your life. You'll see the results when you get older. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Finally, I'm at my last point. God's great hand. God's guided help. But finally, I want you to see God's gracious heart. That God loves new beginnings because God himself, God Almighty, has a gracious heart heart. God is full of grace. God is full of mercy. Preacher, how do you know that? God is patient. Can you imagine while he was walking with the children of Israel, their complete rebellion. All the time. Your children ever get on your nerves? Whoa, hey, I didn't I mean, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to verbalize respond. Sometimes our children sometimes our children push on, on our nerves. They, 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 they weary our nerves. They burden our nerves. They uh, increase the pressure on our nerves. They, they strain our nerves. They uh, wear our nerves out. Are you getting my point? So, uh, why does that happen? Because you keep telling them to do this and you tell them to do that and they rebel. And they refuse to do what's right. If you got a job and your boss keeps telling you to do do this and you don't do it, what usually happens to you? Amen. You get fired. How, how does that look with God's children? God doesn't fire you, but he will discipline you. But he's so gracious that God is patient with you. That when you and I, when we get into a funk of rebellion, God is patient to keep on walking with you and to keep helping you, even in your time of rebellion. No, preacher, we, God judges them. No, God shows mercy on whom he wills. Even when we don't show mercy, God shows mercy. Oh, yeah. That's why we should never judge people. That's why we shouldn't put our mouths on people because you, you don't know what God is doing in that person's life and how he's trying to bring them full circle and back into obedience with him. Even if they've been disobedient, God is patient because he has a great, big, gracious heart. And he walked with them even when they refused to change their ways. God stayed with them. Amen. He allowed the parents to die out and let the children raise up. But he stayed with them until the children decided they were going to follow Jesus Christ. Or they were going to follow God. Not only is God gracious, but God, God, is, God is patient. But also God is very, very merciful. God is not trying to push the red button on you as quick as you think he is. God is not trying to... Trying to, trying to condemn you and damn you to an eternal hell the way some of us believe he is. God is very merciful. Yes. And that's why he said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. God is merciful. And you and I should be merciful. God does not repay us for all of our evil. Matter of fact, if, if the Lord would keep track of all of our evil, the text says, Who could stand? 
Who could bear under all of the things that we do sometimes? But praise be unto God that the Lord has provided a way out by the, our Savior Jesus Christ. God is patient. God is merciful. And finally, church, God is faithful. He's, he has such a gracious heart that he's patient, he's merciful, and he is faithful. God saw these people all the way through the end. He told Abraham, I'm going to make a promise to you that I'm going to raise up a nation. I'm going to raise up children for you. It will be innumerable. Uh -huh. God had such rebellious people, but you know God did not abandon what he uh -huh. promised.